Hi, this is Lindsay Oden, Special Research Assistant at the Washington State Attorney General's Office, and this is your AGO Moment in History. In this series, our office will be releasing clips from our Oral History Project, an ongoing effort to collect and preserve the history of the Attorney General's Office, as told by the people who have worked here over the years. In today's episode, former Deputy AGs Jeff Goltz and Shirley Batten interview former Attorney General Ken Eikenberry about his transition into the AGO. In 1980, Eikenberry was elected to the first of his three terms as Attorney General. He took over an office that was being vacated by Slade Gordon, who had just finished his third term as AG and had just won his own election to the U.S. Senate. This episode focuses on the programs initiated by Eikenberry and the culture of the AGO. Let's take a listen. So, um... Getting back, so you won the election for attorney general the first time, and now all of a sudden you're head of this large public law office. So how did you settle into managing such a, a big law firm? Yes, that um, well, it was a uh, it was an awesome situation for me, um, and I started it out by uh, interviewing every lawyer, and every supervising person, in fact, anyone who wanted to talk with me around the state of Washington. And fortunately, uh, Slade Gorton, while he was still Attorney General, hired me into the office, uh, and this was in December, uh, hired me into the office, so I, at least at that point, I wasn't working without a salary. And it also opened the door for me to interview uh, people from Seattle, as Spokane, or wherever, and I took, I kept a notebook and um, <clears throat> wrote down, uh, kept those notes, and used them throughout my term. And so, what was, what did you find most challenging about all of a sudden? Because in private practice or as a legislator, you weren't managing large groups of people. So, what was most challenging for you, and how did you address that? Well, um, actually. Uh, <laughs> One of the uh, ongoing principles that I used as Attorney General did start with in a small firm, and that was when uh, one of our members had missed a uh, deadline uh, for filing an appellate brief. And uh, not only that, uh, not only did we was I uncomfortable with the number of cases we had going on. We did not know how many we had going on at that time. I remember. And uh, in fact, it was rather stunning to learn that uh, after we finally got the money from the legislature and we got our uh, cases online and uh, counted, we had some uh, in excess of 20,000 cases, as I recall, including in court and administrative mm -hmm. cases. So that's a bunch of bunch of things that can go wrong if you're not staying on top of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, both Shirley and I were in the office at the time, and you took over for Slade Gordon. We were both hired by Attorney General Gordon. And um, so we have some personal memories of all this. But the um, I don't recall massive turnover in the office um, when you came in. Um, well, what, did you make m many staffing changes? No. As a matter of fact... Uh, <laughs> It's interesting, uh, no, we didn't have uh, very many, we didn't have any changes, uh, but Slade told me when I did that interview that I referred to earlier, he told me there's one guy I should have changed that he should have fired and that uh, I might well want to unload that person. Well, um, I got a call from... That wasn't me, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> And I'm seeking to avoid naming this person now. And Good idea. <laughs> but, but I got a call from a from the representative of who, people who this person worked for, and uh, they were asking if I couldn't fire him. And I said, well, the person you're talking about is so near retirement that I'm not going to fire him, but what I will move do is move him out of being the head of that division. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, also I'm going to require that he stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And about a month later I got a phone call from the same person 
saying, you know, we like this guy a lot better when he was drinking. Could you stop? <laughs> Could you change that rule? <laughs> and so he's that person was long gone. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. And you also appointed Ed Mackey as chief deputy. Yes. One of the best decisions, uh, one of the best organizational steps that I took, uh, because I think you know, Ed is one of the few people I know who plays three-dimensional chess. Mm -hmm. and But it tells you, it's suggestive of what of his skill in managing things, in planning ahead. And as a matter of fact, Ed could see problems coming up uh, some distance in advance, and he'd get ahead of the wave, so to speak, and, and ride it into the beach instead of just being crushed by it. And he was your chief deputy for your entire tenure in the office, Correct. wasn't he? Correct. As a matter of fact, Ed even uh, continued on uh, past his uh, retirement date uh, to stay on throughout the time I was in office. So um, tell us a little bit about the office as, as you found it. Um, and what was the culture like in the office? Um, you know, what did you find? You had offices in Olympia and Seattle and Spokane. And very, what did you find? What, what what did you notice about the office when you yeah you know, well uh, <laughs> the office was really a collection of individuals that were not, <laughs> not on the same page with each other <clears throat> we didn't have, there was no I didn't feel that there was an esprit de corps uh, at all for the office of attorney general and. Uh, one of the people that I had interviewed uh, over in Spokane was Chris Gregoire, who at that time was head of the Social and Health Services Division in Spokane. And um, what I knew, what I found from interviewing the attorneys was that everybody, everyone felt they were doing a good, important work. They felt like the work was being each, evenly apportioned, uh, like they were being recognized. And I said to myself, this is a person that uh, I want to get to know better. And so uh, she was shortly thereafter became the head of the Spokane office. And then I asked her to come to Olympia as a deputy, or as a deputy uh, attorney general and uh, be one of the five, at that time I think we had set five supervising attorneys in the office. And the rest is history for her. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what, what was your, you found this office, uh, and what was your? How would you describe your leadership style at, for at that time? Well, <laughs> I have to admit that um, there was a, a kind of a joke going around the office because one of the early things I did was to invite uh, the people from. Uh, Dale Carnegie, self improvement uh, yeah. right. course, to uh, be at a conference. And uh, that was taken with a grain of humor, I'm sure. Yeah. But from that point on, uh, and under the leadership of particularly Kathy uh, Spong and uh, Chris Gregoire, we developed our uh, ongoing annual conferences for the office. And that really was important. And provide a it provided the continuing le uh, legal education credits that every lawyer in the office needed, mm -hmm. and it also uh, provided acquaintanceship across uh, city and county and state lines. And it also, but perhaps most important, it helped provide a sense of community for the off people in the, who were in the office. And uh, slightly different uh, question, but uh, we remember your wife, Bev, as being very much a part of the Attorney General family. And if she were sitting in your spot rather than off camera, what uh, would she say about your 12 years as Attorney General? Well, it probably, she would say that she sure seemed to spend a lot of time preparing dinners or parties or <laughs> things like that. <laughs> were attended by people either that we worked for or did work work with in the Office of Attorney General. I know that <clears throat> she would come to our conferences, <clears throat> and to this day she's wearing a wristwatch that was uh, for sale 
I thought it was a gift, but turned out it was for sale as one of the items that people could buy to support the ongoing conferences. So, um, another emphasis during your tenure was that of professionalism. I recall that when you came into office and during your 12, your 12 years. So why so much focus on that? Yes, well, um, I certainly did believe and believe to this day that uh, the appearance is uh, as important as the presentation you make in the rest of the presentation you make in a courtroom or to the public or anybody else that's viewing a situation. So I insisted that people be professionally dressed, including a jacket and a tie, which I'm not wearing today because it's a matter of choice. Uh, You're entitled. <laughs> but I recall that uh, some, a few people did re kind of resent the jacket requirement, and they would have the jacket hanging behind on a hook hanging behind the door in case I showed up. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I was aware of that. No, no Jeans Friday in the Eichinger administration. No. <laughs> no Jeans Friday. And I recognize that that's a big thing today, and mm -hmm. uh, some people go along with it, but uh, it's not for me. But you even had, a, as I recall, you, I don't know if it's an office motto or an office declaration, but our objective is to be a professional problem-solving organization. And that was one of the themes that, of your administration. Yes, we formally adopted this uh, statement, mm -hmm. as you recited it, uh, at one of our conferences. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a result of people having worked on it and why well, picked uh, fly spec uh, words, and, and uh, I think that what you've said expresses the uh, goal of the office. Let me read the whole thing. It says, our objective is to be a professional problem-solving organization that will ethically represent our clients and the people of the state. And that catches everything, I think, that we have in mind. Another thing that you, um, you, you trusted your assistance and in dealing with the press, um, you... I believe we had a new policy that would basically authorize the, the lawyers to go ahead and respond <coughs> immediately to the press and report later. Uh, very true, and um, of this, this was especially true in some of the outlying offices because they're the only contact people had with the Office of Attorney General was through lawyers that happened to be working in that that office. But uh, my requirement was. Uh, I guess it was resented by some, and it was new requirement that when a person had finished uh, discussing a case with a reporter on the phone or in the or in their office, that they simply call to my secretary and give the gist of the conversation. And uh, my rule of thumb was that I simply did not want to learn about whatever it was they were discussing by reading the newspaper. Right. I wanted to know about it. Uh, that it was an issue that it had been discussed. Or by being asked by a reporter later on. <laughs> well, uh, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly right. Thanks for listening to this AGO Moment in History. Be sure to like and subscribe to receive updates when we upload a new episode. On our next episode, General Likenberry discusses how he negotiated relationships with other parts of Washington's government, including the governor's office and other state agencies, during his time as AG. Thanks, and talk to you again soon.